There are so many talented people in this congregation. I love hearing all of these voices singing and reading in our services each week. I am grateful. As we um, began our Epiphany series last Sunday, we talked about the need to inhabit our lives, to be responsible for writing our life stories. On Monday, many of us began writing to remember. We challenged each other to begin the process of writing morning pages, an idea that comes from the book The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Our goal over these next few weeks is simple. Together, we're looking for ways to give ourselves permission to live our lives deeply rather than simply going through the motions. Because rather than waiting for permission and waiting for someone else to tell us who we are and how to live our lives, we are embracing this opportunity to listen for those invitations to be all we have been created to be in this world. This week, we turn to saying yes to God, to our life, to all that is and will be. After Jesus stepped out of the Jordan River, after Jesus heard the voice of God reminding him he was the beloved, Jesus packed up and moved. He left Nazareth, and he settled in Capernaum. In the next verse, the writer of Matthew reminds us of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people who have lived in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. As Jesus began to say yes to his own life, he proclaimed a compelling message, change your hearts and minds for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus said yes to his own life, when people could see and feel that yes, they were free to step up and say yes and follow Jesus. I thought a lot about Dr. King as I lived with this text throughout the week. I imagine Dr. King had to say, an intense yes to who he was. He had to say yes to God, and he had to say yes to the life that was opening before him. Yet from everything I have read, I understand in part how hard that yes must have been. Dr. King could have been so many things. He could have chosen to be a professor, to teach religion. He could have lectured about the injustice and the systematic racism that continued to be the sin of this nation then and now. He could have convinced those young ministers who surely would have sat at his feet to go out and march and change the world while he stayed within the protected walls of the university. Dr. King could have pastored one of the large, great churches of our land, I'm sure even though he would have been pushing the stained glass ceilings as a black man, there were cathedral churches who would have called him to be their senior minister. Not this church, because we hadn't integrated at that time. But there were churches who would have given him a pulpit as big and as high as this. He could have been very influential. Dr. King could have gone into politics. He probably would have needed to move out of the South, even though the history of black senators and representatives in Congress was slow and small. Dr. King, with his powerful voice and his conviction for justice, could certainly have found a place in those hallowed halls. Instead, Dr. King said yes to a difficult calling that came with a hard road. When I gave the overview of the trajectory of the scripture this morning, I, I went straight from the Jordan River, where Jesus was reminded of his belovedness, to his move to Capernaum and the calling of his first disciples. Essentially, I gave you the beginning, 
and the end of that sequence. But I left out the middle, the part that happened in the desert. For many of us, our yes begins in the wilderness. Sometimes I have trouble telling this part of the story because of my discomfort with the idea of a literal devil. Many biblical scholars believe that our modern understanding of the devil or the Satan, as it is referred to in the Hebrew Bible, was misrepresented by the early Christians. Dr. Henry Kelly is a distinguished research professor of English at UCLA. He is also one of the world's leading experts on Satan. I somehow missed this. In my guide to LA when I moved here, no one said anything about a leading expert on Satan being right in my neighborhood. This I would have remembered, theology geek that I am. And now, of course, I have to find a way to meet this man. The devil is problematic on so many levels, but that, that is another sermon, I think, for another day. It presents a problem here, though, because if we don't believe in an actual devil, how do we understand evil? And the stories of Jesus, the stories of Dr. King, certainly contain a lot of evil. I think it would be safe to say a lot of us are conflicted about this character. The devil, Satan, has become for many of us the perfect foil, the character that we can blame for bad behavior, especially in other people, as in he sold his soul to the devil. But we also like to use it personally when it's convenient, as in the devil made me do it. Not my bad choices, not my decisions that have harmed others, not the things I have done and never apologized for or made amends. All of that is not on me. In a message that is all about saying yes, it would have been much easier to only cover the verses Nanika read and just leave out that whole part Obi read. We could have this morning lived simply in the goodness of the first disciples saying yes to Jesus. This week in my journaling, one morning as I was letting my stream of consciousness wander to the sermon for today, I was writing a list of things to say yes to. Humbly, I have to say, it was brilliant. <laughs> but somewhere, about the middle of the second page of the two of three that I'm writing every morning with you, I started realizing, before we are in a position to say yes to a myriad of wonderful things, we may need to say no to other things that seem equally as good. I wonder how many things Dr. King said no to before he said yes. In the narrative of Matthew 4, the devil tempts Jesus with a variety of things that feel right and good. These are things that could have made the life of Jesus perfect. Why is it that good things of life can sometimes turn in us and lead us down a path we never wanted to go? There is nothing inherently wrong with being successful. There is nothing bad about ethically making a ton of money. It's a good thing to get a part in a blockbuster movie, and it's an even better thing to write a script that will win an Oscar. It's a great thing to finally finish your PhD and publish your first book. It's wonderful to have a house and a car and influence and abundance. But what happens when the good things we manage to obtain turn us into people we do not recognize, people we never intended to be. No one sets out to be a cheat or a charlatan. No one makes it their top priority to screw over as many people as they possibly can in one lifetime. 
Perhaps it is instead that subtle desire or behavior that goes from good to bad, sometimes before we even realize it's happening. Some of the saddest parts of life come when we give into what should have been good and now has become evil. On the way to the Southern Leadership Christian Conference Gala at the Getty, that is really a mouthful, I understand why they call it SCLC. On Friday night, Michael, David, and I were talking through this sermon in the car. It was such a great conversation, I wish I would have just hit record on my phone, and then we could have just sat back and played it for you this morning. Over that long car ride to the west side, we discussed several individuals and situations that are front and center in the news these days. We talked about the decisions that may have seemed innocuous in the beginning, but decisions that turned out to hurt and harm people's lives. The three of us wondered if perhaps many of these things could have been different. If only the people had owned what they had done had asked for forgiveness, and then made the necessary amends. Instead, they ended up denying that what they did was wrong. And that denial and what it does to our souls might just be the definition of evil. This is so easy to see in other people and so hard to see in ourselves. I desperately want my yeses to mean yes and my noes to mean no. I want people in my life who help me be my best self. I want people in life who call me on my stuff and who remind me that goodness has to be constantly cultivated. It does not automatically grow in any of our lives. Today is a communion Sunday for us, and it is especially poignant on this day when we remember Dr. King. Some of the stories about Dr. King and his work that I love most are the stories that happened around the kitchen tables of the people who loved and supported him. In every city where he worked and preached and marched, there were people who opened their homes and their hearts to Dr. King and those who traveled with him. Those dear souls would make his favorite meals, play and sing the music he cherished, and tell stories around those tables, stories that reminded Martin of who he truly was. They also loved him enough to be honest and to tell him when they believed he was stepping off the path of his yes. Those are true friends. Always on this Sunday when we remember Dr. King I love for us to sing, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, because it was one of his favorite hymns. I think when he said no to so many other paths and yes to the one he was called to, he put his hand in the hand of God and walked right into a life that would not be free of sorrow but a life that would tell of a dream for a people who would become the beloved community and would teach the rest of us to say no before we said yes. Dr. King's story sounds very much like the story of the one whose way he followed. A life that began in the Jordan River A life that said no, so that a yes could change the world. My hope is that in this week, as you join me in writing to remember, you will find your yes in the path that is uniquely yours. May it be so.